watching Chopping It Up with Roger Kador and Perry White. All right, we are live, chopping it up with Coach Roger Kadar and Perry White. I am Perry White. He is the man, the myth, the legend himself. Roger Kadar, my man on the board, working it behind the scenes. Garrett Edgerson, good morning, Coach. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, what, I don't know what's going on. How was your weekend? Let's start there. Huh? I ain't had a chance to, to, to brief to get an update. How was your weekend, Coach? How was okay in yours? Matter of fact, how was your morning? <laughs> I got up. I got up and, hey. and have to deal with you. I know, Coach, on my ass today. Hey, hey let me man, try. watch your language. <laughs> Let's try to get it together this morning. Good morning to everybody out there. Hit that subscribe button right there underneath the video. Become a subscriber. We love to have your support as always. Uh, Coach. Yes, sir. Another day, another dollar. That's what they say. That's in the the world, that's what they call it. That is what they call it, man. You know, looking at this weekend, I had a chance to look at the SWAC Championship, Florida and m Prairie View, had opportunity to play each other. Uh, did you get a chance to check out any football? Uh, yes, I did watch some football. I can't remember. I watched a little of. Yeah, Washington and Oregon well, Friday I, night. I was asleep, so. You went to sleep? Yeah, I'm sure they played late. You had Alabama and Georgia. Did you get a chance to check that out? Uh, some of it. I usually don't watch the whole games. Okay. And uh, I watch, no, I, mean, I, watch, I guess fam, Florida State and Louisville a little of that, I guess. Oh, yeah, you know, the college football playoffs came out. Michigan, the number one team in the nation. Washington, the number two team. And then you finished out with three and four with Texas and Alabama, man. And everybody felt like Florida State got snubbed in that in some type of way. And G and I had this conversation yesterday. I think they did get snubbed when you looked at going undefeated, winning a conference championship, and doing everything that they needed. Coach, I got to ask you, when a team has a star player and that star player gets hurt, what is your thoughts on people holding that against the rest of the team to say that they don't seem to think this team could be able to contend for a national title just because their star player got hurt and not considering the rest of the team? If I had to fall, be forward thinking, and the scenario I would only can come up with is that the NCAA they won't – egg on their face again this year with what happened last year with Texas Tech or whoever that was that got in and the game was over in the first two or three minutes mm -hmm. and it kills rating, hurt sponsorship. They wanted to put the four best teams they think can deliver on a really good championship. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's what they were trying to do. Florida State does deserve to be in. But with a quarterback down and your second quarterback down, what you think they're going to do? These people ain't stupid. They they rather hurt the kids and make the dollar mm -hmm. than reward the kids and lose the money. I mean, that's really what it comes out to. Mm -hmm. It's about the dollar. You got to uh, satisfy your sponsors. Yeah. They're paying a lot of money. And who is better to give them bang for that dollar than Alabama? <laughs> you know, so then who coach <laughs> Alabama? So I think that's who will give them a bigger bang for that dollar. That's my thinking yeah. on the whole thing. I knew something had to happen when Alabama was sitting there with one loss, mm -hmm. and somebody was going to have to get burned. Uh, you know, uh, you had to get them in there, and they won the SEC, the best league in the in the whole. College football? Yeah. Yeah. How could you not get an SEC champion in there? I mean, to be honest, the SEC as a whole has been down this year, though. Yes. If, if I looked at it, the Pac-12 has been strong, a, a stronger league than the SEC this year. Maybe. I, I just thought it was a snub to the kids, man. I mean, you yeah. go out there, and even what you said with all of the adversity, 
down to the third quarterback and you still found a way to win. Louisville was no slouch of a team, ranked number 14. They was number 10 in the nation before they lost the week before uh, to Kentucky. But nonetheless, man, the kids deserve it when you – because at this point – it's it, it, It's not about them at that point. It was about the money. So is this whole thing politically skewed is what you would say? It's been that way when yeah. you thought it wasn't. Yeah. It has always been that way. The kids are who they use to get – to make the money, to bring the big sponsorships in. They use the kids, you mm -hmm. got me? And they've done it for so long now, there are some players being rewarded with the NIL money. But look at all the years that we've used, we have used kids. Mm -hmm. And we used it with you getting an education. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> Paying for an education, I bet. Let me ask you this. Have you ever, throughout your coaching years, felt like, you got snubbed on anything in terms of the team, maybe a yeah. seed, maybe a region. Yeah, we got we got uh, not a seed, but a region, a regional bid when they went letting us in. Uh, and I had really great teams in the nineties, like ninety one, ninety two, ninety three. They didn't let us in because they because of strain of schedule, or the, you know, they were using. But we weren't. We didn't fit into that. We really were a good team. You got me? Mm -hmm. We had really good players. And they tried to use it uh, with when we had Ricky Weeks and Michael Wood and Fred Lewis and Andre and Gray and on and on and on and on. Had all those good players. And they were trying to say, oh, you're playing the swike and the swike is this, the swike is that. But I'll be doggone if it is. It's more than that. And when they put us in there, we showed them. We were legitimate. So they was trying to keep you out, or you was trying to host the re what, what, what was well, that whole scenario? They, it was just negative stuff. Oh, okay. You know, even after we beat Cal State Fullerton in 87, they were trying to kick us out for 88, and then we took Texas on that place to the brink of defeat at the very last to the eighth inning. And the next year, they pulled the rug. They pulled the rug. So, and... And like I said, we were definite above everybody else in the league. But Gremlin and Jackson were good, too. Mm -hmm. They were really good. But, you know, it's just crazy. You know, you look overall, what do you tell your team when you're dealing with that type of adversity, <clears throat> Coach? Uh, what else can the coach say, hey, man, it's out of our hands? Yeah. Somebody made a decision that was political. Mm -hmm. I mean, they basically, it was a political decision. Okay. Hey, it, it definitely was. Let's get ready to take a break. We'll come back. We'll try to get some things in the work here on the show. So y'all stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Chop It Up with Coach Roger Cato on Perry White. All right? Some Baton Rouge business travelers travel out of Baton Rouge. Some don't. The ones that do know BTR is all about being closer, more convenient, with non-stops and short hops to anywhere their business takes them. They also know not flying BTR means more traffic, longer lines, and wasted time. So if it's about going from driveway to runway with a lot less highway, isn't it about time you flew BTR? Baton Rouge Metro Airport. It's about time. Smart Baton Rouge business travelers travel out of Baton Rouge because BTR is so close and convenient, they're always one step ahead rather than dead on their feet. So isn't it about time you flew BTR? Baton Rouge Metro Airport. Getting a letter from the IRS that you owe back taxes can be scary, but it doesn't have to be. Call Go Tax Resolution in Lafayette at 337-420-1040 today. We'll help stop garnishments, levies, and seizures immediately. With over 35 years of dealing directly with the IRS, our team of local professionals will help you pay the least amount possible. So if you owe back taxes to the IRS, you need help. Call the tax professionals at Go Tax Resolution in Lafayette at 337-420-1040. BRAC implemented the Imagine Your Park strategic plan nearly 20 years ago. The results transform the park system in East Baton Rouge Parish. There are 12 new community parks, six dog parks, Liberty Lagoon Water Park, skateboard parks, fishing ponds, a new conservation area in Central, improved playgrounds, and a growing trail system. It's really a lot to keep track of. So we decided to give you an insider's peek into some of these amazing new community assets through the eyes of the folks who know them best, Brack's community partners. My name is Nathaniel Clone, 
and I am Paddle DR. What I often say I am is chief doer of stuff. <laughs> The two things that everyone wanted were paddling and trails, and in our case, paddle trails. <laughs> and so we did a lot of work to make it so that people could get out on the bayou, but without access points, no one can use them. Breck has been amazing at building paddle launch sites so that we can get out on the water and enjoy everything that Baton Rouge has to offer. Not only are they listening to everything that Imagine Your Parks and Imagine Your Parks 2 that we ask for, but it's actually getting done, which I don't know about you, but that makes me happy every day of the week. No wonder, Breck is the recipient of the National Gold Medal by the National Recreation and Parks Association. There really is something about East Baton Rouge and national champions. Breck, number one and still getting better. With over 60 years of combined experience, Kathy Sherburn and Anna Barnett bring a wealth of knowledge and excitement to the framing industry. Keeping strong to the Louisiana culture, Acadian Frame and Art has numerous local artists and sports team memorabilia for their customers to choose from. Whether you're creating a gallery-like setting in your office or simply looking for some fun art for your kid's playroom, Acadian Frame and Art is your one-stop picture framing spot. Call 225-927-6129 or go to www.acadianframe.com. Get the memoir from the legendary baseball coach from Southern University, Roger Kador. Against all odds, Roger refused to let his past dictate his future by rising to legendary college baseball status. An inspiring story of tenacity, faith, and hope. Against all odds chronicles Coach Kador's determination to reach higher, to want more, and to dig deeper to find the courage to chase his dreams. Against all odds, get yours today by Cater and Cater Publishing. You are now watching Chopping It Up with Roger Cater and Perry White. All right, it is Chopping It Up with Coach Roger Cater. I am Perry White, my man on the board, Garrett Edison. Coach, a big upset yesterday. Southern University basketball, men's basketball team, go on the road and upset number 21, Mississippi State. Can you believe that? Yes. Yeah. You mean, um, yeah, go I mean, ahead. You know, those kind of things do happen. It won't happen in football, per se, but it could happen. And basketball is hard to happen mm -hmm. because normally the team that's most talented always win. But it happen, occurs more in baseball because baseball is an unfair game. It's not very – you can hit all line drives and get caught, mm -hmm. and you can hit bloopers, and they fall in. And that's the thing about baseball. Mm -hmm. But basketball, football, the best teams usually going to win. When you look at the playing field, and they say you kind of get an even playing field in basketball uh, mm -hmm. and in baseball, and the, most of the other sports aside from football, what does an even playing field sound like or looks like? <laughs> uh, can I tell you a story? Please. I remember when historical black schools first going to play white schools in basketball, mm -hmm. and they were taking the money. And going and boy, those officials was gave them no break. And boy, one guy named Covington used to be the coach at Jackson State mm -hmm. said he was griping and I can't use the word. And the official said, "I don't understand what you're griping about. You got all that money. You think you were going to get out of here with a win?" <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very political. Uh, he understood. We done paid all this money. Don't let them out of here with a victory. Uh huh. And when you sneak out of it with a victory and the money, is that that's like getting out of there a thief in the night, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's gonna be. It used to be hard to get out of there. I mean, I've been down there. I mean, you know, I never took uh, guarantees, but I've been on the play teams where they wouldn't let you. I mean, it had to be very difficult. I mean, it's it's just the world we were living in. Society had an issue. Mm -hmm with the black-white situation, you got mm -hmm. me? And finally, things were put in place. Well, officials had to be fair. Yeah. You know, they weren't always fair. In this I day and age of video. Yeah, yeah, and I can sit here and tell you they weren't fair. I've said a few things to a few of them. Really? 
that I can't repeat or won't repeat <laughs> on this radio or TV on YouTube. I mean, just terrible. Yeah. Terrible what they would do to kids. I can only imagine what you walked out there and your your stature of a man and, and walk straight down and do you have did you have a point at him? I probably did. <laughs> I probably did. But I always left try to say something that would touch their heart. Yeah. Because you can't always say the negative things. Yeah. Negative with negative don't produce positive. That's it. You know, it doesn't work that way. So I would always try to leave them with something that that God related, God fearing, put it in their hearts to think about it. So then it may not change this event, but it may be changing an event that's going to happen with other young people in life. You got me? Let me ask you this, because we're talking about upsets, and I know the postseason play uh, upsets have happened for you, but regular season, what has been the the biggest regular season? And, and I don't want to call it an upset because I know you went in willing to win every game, but what was the biggest, and, and then I guess not using LSU, the biggest, because <laughs> that's easy to throw out there, right? The biggest regular season upset for you throughout your coaching career of baseball at Southern. I really, oh man, we, I know we beat uh, Air, uh, San Diego State with uh, with Tony Gwynn. Uh, I mean, we had many, so many, I can't remember all of them. Yeah. I'm not one that cherish them and put them in a box and pull them out and look at them. And I but guess I, I'm looking at the game where they thinking, Southern comes in, this is a W for us, and then Southern leaves out of there and Southern gets the W for you. Yeah, yeah. Because I know a lot of people like the uh, the big games, the wins against the LSU's, the Cal State Fullerton's, the going and playing in the regionals. But you know those regular season games where you know you schedule all of these opponents, right? Yeah. And those opponents looking at you on the schedule like that's a W for us. When their fans see, oh, who is this school? Southern? Oh man, we should win that game, right? I wonder if people, coaches, really look at that and say, oh, this is a win. This is a win. This is a. Lo-. I never no- thought about it in that way. Yeah. But someone like you would sit around and think about, oh, this is a W. Yeah. That's sure what y'all do. If LSU sees Southern, Magnese, Nichols, or any one of those schools on their schedule, you, I know they looking at that as fans and everybody else. Like, that's the reason we scheduled them to get a W. Okay. That's why we're paying them the money. You just said to come in here and lose. Okay. <laughs> we're paying you the money because we're trying to beat you. Okay. We it, need it's kind of different in, in baseball, though. Can you we know, call Gary everybody. Sheffield back here? Oh, yeah. Let me see it and so I can go get him on the line. So go ahead, G. Yeah, it's kind of different in baseball. You know, baseball is one of them sports where anybody can get beat. Is there football? We already know. Yeah. The LSU playing Southeastern, we already know what's about to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to see Southern. And LSU right now in baseball. Hold on, let's get Mr. Sheffield on the line. That's the good thing about this show. We just, we on the roll. Yeah, one thing about you, you're pretty good. I'm going to tell him I'm a bill collector, coach. (laughs) No, don't do that. Hey, Gary. Gary. He hung up on us. Okay, maybe he didn't read his text. Maybe oh. he heard me say Bill Collector. Oh, yeah, G. hold on. <laughs> Hello? Hey, Gary, we're going to call you back on that number that that number I just called you from, okay? Okay, what time y'all starting? We start now. Okay. Okay, we're going to call you right back. All right. Here we go. This is live on the air, folks. This is how we get it done. Well, only you. That's it. That thing loud. Hello? Gary. Hi, how you doing? All right, Coach Kedar here. I'm here with Mr. Perry White. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, we live here on the show, and it's good to have you on here, man. This is a legend. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Come on now. Look, don't give me that little laugh, man. Listen. (laughs) How often do you hear that? Um, quite often, you know, especially when I'm around, you know, guys that 
younger than me, you know, you know, you have your your guys and your peers or whatever. Yeah. They show you respect as well. Well, I grew up watching you play for the Braves, and you, you're a nine-time All-Star, All-Star in 92, 93, 96, 98 through 2000, 2003, and 2005. You won a World Series championship in 97, and you are a Silver Slugger Award winner five times. I mean, that sounds very much like a complete – I don't know what's going on. Are they looking for you back there, Gary? No, nah, no, nah, I'm, I'm crossed from a hospital at the eye clinic. <laughs> <laughs> so hey. I'm, evidently somebody going to the hospital. Hey, I yeah. said I'm, I'm reading off all his stats, and they looking for him out there. <laughs> uh, no, nah, no, nah, I ain't got nothing like that going on. Man, how you been? I've been good, man. I just uh, been just staying low key, focused on my kids, focused on my family, um, and that's pretty much it. You know, I got a son at Georgetown. He's a junior now. We, he's getting that close to that degree. Um, you know, and that's what my, my prized possessions and that's what I cherish the most. I know you're from the Tampa area, and I frequent that area. I love Tampa. That's one of my favorite uh, vacation spots. Clearwater Beach, man. How often do you go over there? Um, we go over there on the weekend during the summer. Uh-huh. Uh, we spend a lot of time over there on the weekend. My wife and I, we just uh, talked about probably getting a little house over there, a little apartment on the beach. You know, that way we can get away with the kids sometimes and family, go over there and hang out on the beach so we don't have to, you know, get stay in hotels. You know, I was out in Tampa one year, and I typically go for my birthday. My birthday's next week, and I go and stay about a week out there. They have that Hilton uh, Resort that's right there on the beach, man. And my first time yeah. going to Tampa, I was out hanging out, and I said, man, which one of the beaches should I go to? And the guy looked at me crazy like, you didn't know about Clearwater? I said, no. He said, man, I proposed yeah. to my wife on the beach. So I said, man, let me go oh, to Clearwater. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a busy area. Yeah, that's the place to be. So, what is life for you these days, Gary? You you didn't retire. You didn't get stepped away from baseball, man. What's going on in your world nowadays? Well, you know, I you know I've been a guy that I was into a lot of business opportunities, playing you know in my my playing days, and owned a lot of real estate, owned a lot of different things, and and I had got to a point where I had vacation homes all this type of stuff. And then I got to a point where I didn't want anything. I just wanted a simple life. Mm. And, you know, since the age of 17, I've been in the spotlight um, on a professional level. And then from eight to 16, I was in the spotlight on the amateur level. So I've been in the spotlight all my life and I wanted to get away from it because I had, I pretty much had enough of it. Um, You know, I kind of stopped liking, uh, you know, be around, you know, celebrities. There's, uh, there's a lot of different, you know, feelings I went through that I want to get away from and just get back to normalcy because that's when I was most happy. Does that world seem like it's, it's kind of full of fakeness or it just it doesn't seem genuine when you're in that type of world all the time? Well, that's that's why I got out of that world because it's not genuine and it's, and it's fake and it's misleading our kids and it's misguiding our youth. And that's why we have a lost generation right now and that's why you know those things matter to me, and and and, and uh, you know when when I when I hear my kids talking about today's world and how they move, and and it sounds like foolishness to me, and I can only imagine what it sounds like to my mother, my grandmother, my great grand <laughs> mm-hmm. when we when, when we was coming up, and now I understand what they were saying about if you keep your life simple and you keep and you stay humble, but but you but you stay confident at the same time. You know, humbleness is a, a misguided word. Uh, by being humble because I think, uh, you know, people want you to downplay your successes. And so because they're, they're like us. And so I tell my kids, you don't have to be humble in certain situations. You know, you got to you got to own the situation. And if you go about your business that way, nobody can fault you about how you got your uh, your mission accomplished. And so that's why I don't apologize for the way I went about things and how I go about my life, but I've always been a genuine person. I've never been one of those guys that's fake, and I I just can't deal with uh, the, the the celebrity fake stuff going on. I can rock with that. Go ahead, Coach. Yeah, uh, Gary, you had the pleasure of playing under a legendary coach that probably a lot of people don't really give him the credit, Billy Reed, who ran all the programs in, in Tampa, Florida, and, and, and developed so many kids into professional play, athletes and baseball players. You know, when I first took the coach at uh, job at Southern, the very first person I called was Billy Reed. 
<laughs> yes. You yes. know, because yes. he had done such a good job in that area. Can you elaborate a little on that about, I know about Lovelace and Kiki Jones and your uncle Dwight Gooden and all the other players that have come through that program over there? Yes, uh, Coach Reed, you know, he was more that disciplinary than anything else. Uh, you know, yes, he was a great coach. He, he knew, he, he didn't just bring you in as a player. He brought you in as a person, and he developed the player. And that was the way he – that's the order that he did it in. And so if you didn't meet certain criteria and you didn't go about your business a certain way in the classroom and outside the classroom, you know, you couldn't play for Coach Reed. Coach Reed would cut the best of the best. He cut my uncle Doc Gooden. Yeah. Um, you know, and so when you talk about – but it made him a man and it made him grow up and it made him toughen up. And so – I, I was the only freshman that ever came to Hillsborough High School and started. Really? Because, he, yes, I was the only one. And under Coach Reed, uh, regime, uh, but he was one of those guys where if you didn't fit the mold, he wasn't giving you anything. And, I, and that's what turned me into a man quick, and it made me accountable, and it made me grow up faster. And so, you know, all those guys that you mentioned, you know, they were great players in high school, and they were great players going forward, but if you look at longevity, mm -hmm. a lot of those guys didn't have the attributes mm -hmm. that me and my uncle had to, to make it as long as we did. Right, exactly. Now, a lot of people don't realize that you were drafted out of high school by Milwaukee as a shortstop. Can you elaborate yeah. on your progression where you moved from short to third and then later in your career to the outfield? Yes. Um, when I got drafted by Milwaukee, I didn't even really know about Milwaukee Brewers organization at all. I thought I was going to be a one-on-one -on -one going to the Pittsburgh Pirates to get the opportunity to play with Barry Bonds. That didn't happen. So I had to go to Milwaukee, and I wound up playing shortstop there. I thought I was a pitcher as well. They had me as a shortstop pitcher. And I got there, and I was, I was going to University of Miami, um, they was they were stalling on my contract, and I was not refused. I, well, I refused to take less than what that value said at that pick. Right. And so I wound up going to school for three weeks, and they came around with the money, and I, I wound up leaving school and going in the hell of the Montana and playing shortstop that night. Um, I wind up um, just out of the blue, just wind up to start wiggling the bat, you know, because I struggled <laughs> the first two days with a wood bat. You know, during our era, we didn't use wood bats when we was growing up. That the, the advantage that these kids have now, they're using wood bats, so they get stronger. They can, you know, they're precise with their swing. I had to find my swing at rookie ball because now we're facing the best of the best. And um, I came up with the waggle, and I wound up being second in the league in hitting, uh, second in home run, and first in RBIs. And that's when my career took off. And uh, you know, when I look back at it and moving from position to position, you know, um, I could have, you know, I, like people always say, you know, the most selfish people always succeed in everything they do. And, you know, that, that, that word selfish can work for you and it can work against you. If you're not about winning, selfish don't, you can't apply selfish to winning. But when it comes to yourself and your well-being of yourself, you should apply selfishness. And I knew I was a better shortstop than anybody they had, but they wanted to move me to third because I was capable of moving to third. And then um, that's when my problem started in Milwaukee because I refused to move to third, but they forced me over there. So, you know, I just looked back at my career and said, what if I would stayed at shortstop with my offensive mm -hmm. numbers? I, I'd probably be ranked one of the best of all time. You're right about that. Did they have Robin Yacht playing shortstop at that time? No, they had uh, Robert Young had moved to center field okay. a couple of years before okay. I got there, All right. All right. and uh, Paul Molitor was the third baseman. Mm -hmm. But Paul Molitor didn't want to play third base, right. so it so it kind of forced me over there because mm -hmm. they drafted Bill Spires a year after uh, me in okay. the first round. Okay, and so uh, and my 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 saying to Bud Selig and everybody who would listen. I'm not moving to third base for no Bill Spires because Bill Spires is not Cal Ripken, right. and so. You know, that's when my problem started. But once I got out of there, I was willing to play third base with the um, San Diego Padres, and I almost won the Triple Crown that year because that's I right. was happy. Well, you know, we're talking to Gary Sheffield, who is in his generation, was probably the best 
power average right hand hitter. Once Aaron, Mays, Clemente, and those guys have retired in banks, you really carry, you know, it's hard to find right hand power hitters who does the average thing and knock in RBI. You were able to fit that mold. Can you? Yeah, and that, and that, but, uh, but that, that, that to me, I know that, and you, you are a baseball player. You know, you know about baseball. You studied the game. You understand the game. But when you talk about writers that don't want to give you your just due, uh, they find every excuse to make to find that try to say that you wasn't what they saw. Um, you know, they can't find one good thing to say, and so they expect you to do interviews and do all these things for them, but they don't give you the respect that you deserve. So, you know, you become you become something that you have to be to get through it, and that's what I did. You know, Gary, it sounds like, and I like the the, the direction of where it sounds like to how you want to step away from everything, and it, it seemed like it gave you a perspective once you stepped away. You had an opportunity to look around and check everything from a different idea, from a different set of eyes, and realize – this ain't what I thought it was going to be. Does that sound like really how it kind of went? That's very accurate. And um, so that's that's one of the things that I say that, you know, I've always been a guy that's been a stand-up person. I never disrespected anybody that didn't disrespect me. I've always stayed with my the way I was raised. Um, these things I prayed about, all these things came true. You know, God revealed a lot of things to me when I, got, I stepped away. Because now, you know, you know who your real friends are and you know genuine people and you know people that, that put on that face when they walk out that door. Um, I don't associate with people like that anymore um, because I don't, I don't have time to be trying to figure out who's real and who's not. So when I was playing, you know, I used to get patronized a lot because, you know, people like to pretend that they're on your side, but then when you turn your back, they're not. And so... I knew what was going on then. I just played dumb through it just to get through it. But now that I'm out of the game and I don't have nobody to, to answer to, I don't have to be on nobody's clock, I operate the way I operate. What would you say to young players these days uh, that are coming up that, you know, with the limelight of the NILs, with the limelight of social media and all of these other things, because people will gravitate to you. People will be false and fake like they're your friends and that they're all around and that they're with you. What would you say to these young players to kind of get them to see that from a young perspective, uh, from a guy that is wise and saw it once the years pass by, to get them to understand, watch who you keep around you and everybody not your friend? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a few opponent, opponents to that. You know, you got to get around people that understand business to get you to understand business because you got to be about your business at all times. Don't waver. Know your worth. Don't settle for less. Get every dime you can get from them because they're making money off you. Mm. And so when you feel like you're worth something, ask for it and stick to it. And if they don't want to give it to you, somebody else will. And so that's the approach that I took. And I think it worked for me. And I think every kid should go out there and get everything they could possibly get so when they retire, they can live the same life they lived when they were playing. Now, here's the big question. Now, I got to I gotta talk, do a walk down memory lane with you. When you look at your career overall, what was the biggest highlight for you when you look at your career and the things that you were able to accomplish? Well, it's, it's, it's been different phases. Uh, when I first got to the big leagues, I, I struggled in Milwaukee because, you know, they was always trying to tell me how to swing, how to hit, how to stand, how to walk, how to act, all of these things. So I was I was a young kid trying to become a man in a, in a man's world. And so that was a, 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 a stepping stone for me to understand who Gary Sheffield really is as a person, as a player, and, uh, and then and eventually becoming a father and then a husband and all these things happen in layers. And so... I always equate Milwaukee made me uh, tougher. Uh, it made me more business-minded. And when I went to San Diego, I had freedom. And I became one of the best players in the game overnight. And um, after that, it was just sustaining what I already knew I could do. And so once I got to the Florida Marlins, my career was solidified when I won the championship. And as once I did that, I pretty much accomplished everything I wanted to do. Now it became... In the latter phase, it became now you go chase numbers. 
and you, because you already won. And if and if if an organization don't want to keep you around more than three years, I'm not married to this organization. I'm just here to do my job and go home. Sound like you always kept it business, nothing personal. Nothing personal. That's why me and Jim Leland and Dave Dabrowski still close to this day, even though I was the first person to be their franchise player to bring Jim Leland his first championship, which probably helped prompt him to get in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Dave Dabrowski, same thing. He was, he was a young general manager that he used to collaborate with me and, and, and talk to me about players and what we should do. And these are the same guys that we won together for the first time. And these are the same guys that released me in Detroit and allowed me to go to the Mets and uh, do what I did and then walk away from the game and still have our friendship intact. Well, Dave Dombrowski and I, we were on the uh, uh, diversity committee, and he had that committee. You are correct when you say he's a wonderful person. He cares about people, and that's important. And you could tell he have a sense of understanding about the plight of minorities. You know what I'm saying, uh, Gary? Absolutely. Um, he was... Uh, he was a guy that, like I said, he kept it on business. If he felt like if Gary Sheffield is the best for this situation, we're going to give him this contract. They gave me 12 years worth of contract. And if I feel like I need to release Gary Sheffield, I'll speak to him man to man mm -hmm. and tell him we think that we need to go in another direction. And as he kept it business. So when he kept it business, I keep it business. But at the same time, you have to respect that. And then you can't be having your feelings on your sleeve when you know that you're a 38, 39-year-old guy that you need to give another young kid an opportunity. And I understood that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, when I was in Detroit, we spoke about what they was doing in Dominican, Puerto Rico, and all these other places with uh, uh, Latino players. And that's when that quote came out that I made that, you know, Major League Baseball is not going to have any blacks in the game when I'm done. And as you see, the yeah. numbers are so low yeah. now. Yeah. Dave DeBrosky was part of that conversation when I said that Bud Selig, I went to his office and I told him, you should have you should have every owner to spend ten million dollars in his own uh, or uh, his own place where they're playing, whether uh -huh. it's the Chicago, the Cubs, right. the White Sox, whether it's the Brewers, whether it's the Mariners, where well, whoever it is, you have former major league players that stayed and lived in those communities that you should build an academy That's to right. let the former former players run those academies. And then now we can go back and bring these kids from the neighborhood to mm -hmm. this academy and develop them into becoming big league ball players. And Major League Baseball declined what we brought to the table, and they said we can't force any owner to do that. But they'll go do it in Dominican. Right. And they'll go spend that money in Dominican with no problem. And so this is where I saw the game going. The day the block saw it going this way. But we couldn't stop it. Right. Well, you are doing something about it, basically. I know you have uh, a situation in Tampa where you do have a lot of kids you brought into the from the community. Can you talk about it? Yes. Um, I went out, and um, a friend of mine, Reggie Williams, told me, Gary, if you want to get what you, you know, if you want your kids to get whatever they need, you're going to have to coach. And I said, man, I don't want to coach. I just want to be a parent and watch the game from the stands. But then when I saw the 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 the, the uh, I, I like to call it um, favoritism towards mm -hmm. kids and certain kids because of who bring the most money or who do this the most or who do that the most, get the most playing time at the at the most permanent positions. And so once my once I saw that, I I got an organization together and I and I had. Um, I patented this, uh, this, this uh, Florida Heat. I thought it was a, a name that probably would have been taken. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an obvious name, the name of the organization in Tampa, Florida, or in Florida general, in general, as we call it, the Florida Heat. And so what I did was it was available. I took the name. I, I built the organization. We became number two in the state of Florida. Uh, we used to go all over the world and play. I used to develop my kids there. And so what I had to do, I had to stop coaching because – I found that I started getting in a lot of altercations with umpires and parents. And when I started doing that, what I found out was organizations that we go play against, the coach and the players, they was playing against me. They mm -hmm. weren't playing against my kids. They was trying to mm -hmm. beat me. Mm -hmm. The umpires was umpiring against me, mm -hmm. not 
umpiring the, the correct way to, you know, whatever the call was uh, need to be made. And so just I'll give you a small example so uh, people don't misread what I'm saying. I, we, we had a requirement to bring five baseballs to a, a tournament. And I used to get, go to Major League Baseball, and I will bring 100 baseballs. And I would give the umpire 10 baseballs, and I will tell him the other team don't have to bring baseballs, I would bring it. So I thought I was doing a positive thing. Mm-hmm. So they took it as I was being arrogant by bringing all of these new baseballs and, and not letting the other team bring them. So they take offense to stuff like that. So then they will put an old baseball in the game to pitch to my kids. <laughs> and then when when my kids come up to pitch, they'll roll out the new baseball. So what I so what I did that day, so I had to set an example. I took my kids off the field. I got my balls, and I left. And I told them, we're not even playing in this tournament. And wind up getting the umpire fired. Um, and so once that happened, everybody thought that everything was being favoritism towards me. Yeah. So that's when I realized, you know, they started coming down hard on my kids. You know, you know, a lot of kids started hating on the fact that my kids have certain things that they don't have. So I had to remove myself from that and do it from a top down to the bottom and let other coaches coach it, and I just run the organization. Okay. You know, that's big what you said, talking about the, the, the idea that you saw into the future of saying that we were going to lose African-American interest in the game of baseball. And we talk about it here all the time. Even when you look at the Little League World Series, you look at the makeup of those teams. Uh, growing up, I played baseball. And when I go back home from where I'm from in Palm Bluff, Arkansas, I look around at a lot of the baseball leagues and fields that used to be completely filled with teams that was coached by dads, uncles, men of the community, and that African-American young males were out there playing baseball in large numbers and now when I go back I look at these fields these fields are no longer in use the grass is growing up the fences are falling in because the interest is not there in baseball anymore uh, you see football and basketball these days where did we go wrong and I'm not not even going to say we where did MLB go wrong with this disconnect to the African American community especially young males being able to see this game as something that they can go play well, number one, it started when we integrated. That's when it started. So once you integrate, now you don't have nothing to go back to. So once they, they get rid of you, you got nowhere to go. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's not a popular thing to say, but I'm, I'm, I'm not involved with the game no more. So I'll say whatever I feel. The thing is, is that when we want to integrate, and we always feel like we need to integrate with people that don't want us around, now – when we want to go back and do something when they don't want us around, now we don't have nothing to go back to. Yeah, it was a great idea to bring Jackie Robinson in. It was great. It was wonderful. And so you will see if Bay Roof and Joe DiMaggio is really good, as they say, and when they face Sassy Page, Ted Williams is the first person to come out and explain how dangerous and, and, and how dominant Sassy Page was. So what you find in that, is that you find out these guys ain't good as you thought they were. Mm. You know, we would, when you, inter, you, you integrate with us, you're going to find out you're not as tough as you thought you were. You're not as good as you thought you were. But when, in doing that, we lost what we had that was successful. And now we, we, we integrate in with you thinking you're going to do right by us, which we should know better. That ain't going to never happen. And once that happens, now once a guy don't have Major League Baseball, what can he go to now? He can't go back to Negro League. That's right. So we don't have nothing. So when you really break it down and look at it and you want to have an honest conversation, think about that for a second. If we had our own league without integrating, yeah, you can go play Major League Baseball if you choose to. That's like live golf and PGA. If you give us options, we'll, we'll be just fine because we can play for you and with you or we don't have to. Mm-hmm. Man, listen, dude. Gary Sheffield, I, so much respect. You somebody I can have a conversation with because, <laughs> look, you not trying to follow and be politically correct, and I agree with you because l- let's have this conversation. It's almost the same way of what people were saying with Deion Sanders leaving Jackson State, uh, being at the HBCUs and then taking all of this star po- power, uh, all of this culture, and taking it to Colorado. Uh, what is your thoughts when you look at, and, and I'm not sure how familiar you are, but when you look at the HBCUs and the positions that they are to give black players and black coaches and to have this format of a culture for us by us because it's basically the last thing that we have to hold on to that's like the negro leagues 
Well, number one, I understand what people are saying by De- Deion should stay at Jackson State, you know, for the black culture. But the black culture is not equipped enough at this point to, to compete with the ACC and the SEC and all the big, you know, pack fives and all these types of guys. Because what, what happens now is that if Deion Sanders, in which he's doing it for his kids, number one, and which he should now, if you're doing it for your kid, you want to put your kid in the best situation as possible to go to the NFL, get as much NIL money as possible. And that's what he's doing. Jackson State could pay Dion more than $500,000. Now he goes and leaves and get $30 million. What Dion is doing, if you really understood what he's doing, which I understand because I talked to him, the bottom line is this man is going out. He's taking a better opportunity, not saying – the, the 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 Colorado Buffalo was a better team. He's saying a better opportunity. So that way he can create jobs for minorities to be in these better opportunities. So now, not only that he's, he's bringing along these, these coaches, now we can bring along these kids because now we're going to get other opportunities when they become available. You don't think Florida State would have loved to have Dion and, and Travis Hunter and his son and all those guys? Yeah, because they could have got recruitment out of every every place. But he had to settle for the bottom of the uh, uh, the, 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 the low-hanging fruit in Buffalo and Colorado. He had to go get the low-hanging fruit and build it up. But he brought his his, his bravado. He brought his, 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 his confidence. He brought everything. Like you say, he brought his Louis Vuitton luggage. But it's going <laughs> to... It's going to be some pain in the, the growing part, but just the fact that way he speak about it, people want to take shots at him. But he's giving everybody opportunity. And so, in theory, yeah, you would have loved to see him stay at the HBCU school and, 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 and we get the credit for it and this and that. But we don't have the dollars to support that. Well, he also took with him to Colorado the people who cook. Because he realized the coach <laughs> yeah. over there. No, he took a lot That's of the right. people who cook. He need some seasoning right. on that food yeah. out there in Colorado. Because they had to make sure he could feed the kids something that they want to eat. You well, know? people people think that it's just one one guy can can make stuff like that happen. Dion is the is the stepping stone for them to look at other athletes mm-hmm. and say, give them an opportunity to, to, to be the head coach because you can bring the dollars and you can bring the black kids to these institutions. And so that's what he's doing. And they're not, they're missing that point. They're just, they're looking at what comes out of his mouth and who is, who is coming from opposed to what he's really doing. And I think what he's doing is remarkable and it's a game changer. I got this for you, Gary. Two questions. The first question is, out of all your years of travel from different teams in different cities, uh, MLB, what city had the best food? The best food? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> oh man! Do remember, he well, don't know you yeah. came from Florida. Hey, he guy forgot yeah. you came from Florida. He's a big guy, so yeah. I know he got to eat somewhere. Somewhere yeah. you sat down and was like, "Hey, this city got it going on." You know, I wasn't a I wasn't a big uh, guy. I wasn't a guy that go out to restaurants. My wife loves to go to restaurants. I like home cooking. Yeah. Uh, but if I had to pick a city that had the best food, I would say New York. Yeah, you're, that's what you, a good. What you one. eating? Pizza? What you eating up there in New York? I used to go to uh, Mr. Uh, I used to go to Mr. Chow. You know, that's that's like a uh, like Chinese food. Mm-hmm. I used to go to uh, Tao. That's like Chinese food. <laughs> I, I, I go to I go to I go to um, I go to like I, I like a lot of Indian food. Okay. I I, I like I like spicy food. Spicy. I like see I like a lot of seafood. Mm. And and if you want to get away from that, whatever. They got all kinds of steak. Peter Luger's, you got all kinds of steak houses where you can eat nice, different kind of steaks. You know, you, you may get a, a, a T-bone, you may get a porterhouse, you may get, but it's cooked all different kind of ways yeah. in different places, and that's what I like about it. That so, diversity to it. New York is the number one list, number one on your list of best food. Now, my second question is, I not access to everybody. You know, we use this term "goat," the greatest of all time, and I think these days people use it so loosely. So you just got to sometime hit a home run. Oh, that was the greatest of all time for you, mm-hmm. growing up, and now where you at in life. 
who's the greatest of all time for you when you look at baseball? Right now or when I play? Just period. Who 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 do you think is the the all time greatest of all time for you? Well, um, it's hard for me to pick a guy that's present that's still playing to to name him as a goat. He don't even have to be pre- he don't have to be he could be whoever, someone you grew up watching, someone that was a you know, uh, influential to you. You know, it, it could be any anything. Well, the, the the only person that I say is the goat to baseball all time is Hank Aaron. Mm. <laughs> yeah, he was the so goat. I, so so I don't care what nobody else says. You know, when it comes to that, that's my opinion. And you can you can't tell me nothing that this man couldn't do. And then so you know a lot a lot of people say Willie Mays. Oh yeah, that's great. You know, but Willie Mays is, is you know he was he was wonderful too. Uh, he might be a close second, but uh, Hank Aaron, to me, was number one. And he did it with a lot of garbage he had to deal with, the tremendous amount of garbage he had to deal with. You know what I'm Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, and that, that's why he's the GOAT. Right, exactly. A lot of people say someone accomplished, what did he go through to do it? I mean, with threats on his life, his family life, getting all these ugly letters, you know, pictures probably throwing at him. You know what I'm saying? He couldn't, and when he first started, he couldn't go to the same hotel, restaurant, all this foolishness that he had to put up with, and yet through it all, he's quietly just slunk in there, hitting 30-some home runs a year, just barely getting them out of the park in many cases because I had the conversation with the hammer, and I said, what made a difference? in your career, late in your career, where you began to hit more home runs. He said, playing in Fulton County Stadium and the live on pitchers came into the league. He said, mm-hmm. once they came in, and because of my wrist action, it was a lot easier for me to hit home runs. Isn't that Yeah, beautiful? I mean, that's the way I felt. Yeah, that's how I felt. You know, when I got older and I understood myself, and when more velocity started coming in, it started being easier for me to do the same thing. And so, yeah. you know, um, I tell p- people all the time, the most difficult pitches to hit is a real pitcher. <laughs> yeah. You know, a, a thrower is just a thrower, yeah, and yeah. he's not gonna he's not gonna get out a great hitter. So if you got a guy that don't know how he knows how to pitch at all times to anybody in every situation, he knows when to come after you. He knows when to back off. Those are the most difficult guys. You like doing podcasts, Gary? Yeah, I, I don't mind. It just depends on who I'm doing it with. And, with uh, Roger like, Kadar like and Perry White. Well, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to see what you're doing on your Monday mornings, man. If you, you know, uh, I, I actually I'm running errands. I've been up. I got up early this morning. I went and weighed in because I'm on this eating program. Um, I'm getting back on my program where I'm getting back to my playing weight. Um, I'm getting active in that. Uh, I, I um, had to go get some alterations from the kids. You know, they, they, the stuff they got at the mall. Now I'm at the, uh, I stopped over to my other place where I, had, uh, I bought something I thought it was in. It, it didn't come in. Now I'm over here at the glasses place uh, making sure my eyes are right. So I'm just, I'm just doing, doing self-care. I understand. And, 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 uh, yeah, and I'm doing all my errands because I got to go out of town tomorrow. All, all the way to Saturday, so I want to make sure I got everything done at home, so that way I don't have to think about anything. Well, listen here, Gary Sheffield, the great, the legend. Hey, I got a newfound respect for him because I get to hear. I don't, I don't get to just watch you on TV like many do. And what I grew up doing, I, I get to hear your voice and have a conversation with you. And you, you are a realist, and I like the fact of how you put it. I like your viewpoint and the st- the fact that you stepped away from the celebrity life to realize it ain't all what people think it is. You know, people think once you get to that life that this is it's like this whole new world, and it is a whole new world. World, a world that does not come with a lot of genuineness and a lot of people that just want to tag along and pull on you just because they want to ride the wave. And I love the fact that you are able to see that and understand that and then don't have any problem with letting people know, hey, this is the real and I'm going to tell it like it is. Yeah, because I, I'm, I'm a big component on about relationships and, and character for your inside character. What, what you have on the inside will come out on the outside. But see, most people have outside character. That's why my book was titled Inside Character, because 
most people have outside characters, so they pretend they like you and they pretend to act a certain way because the camera's on. But when they go behind closed doors, you can't count on those people. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say, that's why I say, you know, the most happiest time of your life is when you didn't have anything. Because now when you get something, all the emphasis is on money. And, 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 and uh, that's why they say, you know, when, 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 when you know, when, if, if, if money is the root of all evil, why the church is always acting for it? <laughs> mm. Yeah. Hey. Hey, hey, don't get to preaching up in here, Gary. Don't get to preaching. <laughs> I see what you're saying, man. Hey, don't get to preaching up in here. Like I said, man, if you yeah. ever free on Mondays from uh, you over there on East Coast time between 11 and 12, man, look, we would love to have you come back, man. Because I think your thoughts and, and the way that you view the world is something that should be heard. And I, I would love to have these conversations about any and everything with Coach and yourself, man, because y you are thought-provoking. You you understand that everything ain't got to be this type of way, but you have no problem with speaking your mind, man. I love to have continued conversations with you anytime, brother. Yeah, y'all let me know, man, anytime. I'll be available. Gary, we appreciate you taking the time out, big guy. And we'll be in okay. touch. Make sure you give a highlight to Reggie for me. I will do, man. I appreciate you guys. Hey, right. I, you eating that grouper uh, over there in Tampa? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. All right, Gary. <laughs> All right, thank you, Gary. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. Right. Take care. Gary Sheffield, man, legendary uh, interview right there, man. Glad the fact that we were able to get him on and have a conversation with him. Everybody, we've reached the end of another episode today of Chopping Up with Coach Roger Kadar and Perry White. Hit that subscribe button underneath the video right there. Become a subscriber. Come back and watch any of the episodes just like you can go back and watch this one. And share it. Put it out there. Let people know what we're doing and be a part of what we're doing. You get that notification every time we go live. Coach, you got something for the people before we get out of here? Man, only you could have pulled off bringing Gary on. How you get all those people's number? No, you got to give yourself credit. I'm just here to talk to them, but you got all them numbers in the phone. Trust me, if I had their numbers, I'd be in Tampa right now kicking <laughs> with Gary Sheffield because that's one of my favorite places to go. So, hey, what else you got? No, no hey, yeah. this was a good show. I've had Gary on the show before, and he's really a, a good guy. He's really a dynary person, mm -hmm. and he just laid out there and let you know. And the people who are realists, can appreciate him. Yeah. I can appreciate him, Ada. I, I enjoyed every bit of that. So from Perry White, Roger Kadar, my man Garrett Edgerson on the board, man, we appreciate you guys and we see you next week. Coach, get us out of here. G doesn't let